Hello, everyone. In this session, we will be discussing an overview of cutaneous lymphomas, including diagnosis and staging. And before we get started, I would like to thank our corporate partners and individual donors. Thank you so much for making these programs possible. Our wonderful speaker for this discussion will be Dr. Stephen Dave Louie. Hi, Dr. Dave Louie. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Hillary. Thanks for having me. Dr. Dave Louie is an associate professor and program director at Wayne State Dermatology. He is also the president of the Wayne County Medical Society of Southeast Michigan. So I'm going to turn things over to you, Dr. Dave Louie. Thanks again very much. And thanks for this opportunity from the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation. And even more importantly, thank you for all that the foundation does for patients with cutaneous lymphoma because it's a difficult disease to navigate and it's, it's a lot to take in. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity and we'll be talking about some of those things that happen when you first are diagnosed. So we'll discuss a little bit about the immune system because that's kind of involved with lymphomas of all types. We'll also try to understand how cutaneous lymphoma is diagnosed and then talk a little bit about the staging system that we have in place for cutaneous lymphoma. So as I mentioned, it's really tough and I, I really feel for patients when we make a diagnosis of a cutaneous lymphoma because a lot of questions start swirling around your head and it's, there's not a, a lot of answers readily available, which again is why the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation is so wonderful because that is their goal is to help provide that information to patients so you can know a little bit more about this disease and know what we know, even though we don't know everything. So a lot of the questions that come up for people at the beginning is, do I have cancer? You know, you said this is a lymphoma, is this a cancer? Is it a skin cancer? I've heard of other people having skin cancer. Um, is this also a skin cancer? Is this similar to those or different? What are my treatment options? What are my prognosis? What do I do now? What's gonna happen? You know, what's gonna happen with this? And we have the answers to some of those questions, but other ones even puzzle people like myself who are involved with lymphoma treatment and research, that we still are learning things ourselves and making advances. So well, let's start with the, the name, cutaneous lymphoma. So cutaneous means skin, and then lymphoma is a cancer of the lymphocytes. Well, what are lymphocytes? They're part of the immune system. So our, the basic function of our immune system is to protect us against invaders like fungus, bacteria, parasites, viruses that try to get into our body and cause an infection in us. And the immune system is spread throughout our whole body and there's certain organs that are more involved and other organs that are less involved. So the immune system kind of has to flow through our whole body looking for any invaders anywhere and go after them. So especially with recent times, you may have heard more about, you know, the COVID virus and it infects us through our, our nose or our mouth. It gets into that mucous membranes and enters there. And that's actually where your immune system starts fighting it. And that's why different people have different responses to it. You know, that's probably why children generally do pretty well, but people with weaker immune systems have more of a struggle with it. So like I said, the immune system is kind of spread through the whole body. Um, the lymph nodes are kind of traditionally thought of as basically an immune organ. So we'll talk a little bit more about them later. And then your spleen and your thymus are some of the organs that make your immune cells, as does your bone marrow. So the, the, the hollow part inside of our bones is actually active and makes these immune cells, sends them into the blood. They flow around and circulate into our tissues looking for invaders and ready to attack them. So the skin is actually one of the biggest immune organs of our body. And if you think about it, our skin really is what interacts with our outside environment the most. We get some through our GI tract, you know, our mouth and our colon, but our skin is really out there all the time fighting off invaders and bacteria and fungus that we come into contact with. In terms of the immune cells, the guys who do the work for the immune system, they're called white blood cells. So if you've ever had your blood drawn, they'll talk about your red blood cells, which carry oxygen throughout the body. They go to the lungs and get oxygen, carry it to our tissues so they can function. They talk about our platelets, which help to clot the blood when you're bleeding. And then the white blood cells. And the white blood cells, there's a few different types. There are lymphocytes, which we'll talk quite a bit about today. 
And then there's a few others called monocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. And they all kind of work together. They have different roles in fighting off different viruses or parasites. Um, and they talk to each other and kind of it's a coordinated effort. Our immune system is actually pretty amazing when you really start to study it and look at all the things it can do. In terms of problems with the immune system, you can have a deficiency where you don't have enough immune cells or enough, or enough of the right kind of immune cells to fight off invaders. So probably the most well-known deficiency is HIV, which is human immunodeficiency virus. And it attacks your T cells and gets you less T cells and then you can't fight off infections as well. And that's why people with HIV are more prone to getting infections. You can also have problems with your immune system um, under the, um, the term autoimmunity with auto being self. So this is when your immune system starts attacking your own body. So some examples of this are things like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, where the immune cells start attacking our own body and causing problems. And sometimes for those patients to treat the problem, we actually have to weaken the immune system so it doesn't attack the body as much. Then the last problem you can have with it is cancer. And most of the cancers of the immune system are either leukemia or lymphoma. So we'll be talking a lot more about the lymphomas because that's what the topic of the talk is, the cutaneous lymphomas. So those lymphocytes, they're one of the red, the white blood cells, um, and there's a couple different kinds of lymphocytes. There are B cells and T cells. And within the T cells, there are helper T cells and cytotoxic or killer T cells. So the killer T cells can go and kill a virus right on contact. The helper T cells, do a little bit more coordinating and getting other parts of the immune system to help out. And B cells make antibodies. So B cells are the reason that vaccines work. We can expose you to a part of an infection, for example, say the flu. We expose your immune system to pieces of the flu virus. And then when the flu virus comes in, it recognizes those pieces and it attacks them with antibodies. So the B cells, once you expose them to something, they go back and make a bunch of antibodies. And that way, when the infection actually comes, you're ready and it shoots all those antibodies to stop it as quickly as possible, either stop it completely or give you a much milder case of infection because your immune system's already fighting it. So in the top right corner is just a nice little schematic diagram that shows a blood vessel and it shows the blood kind of flowing through it. So the plasma looks kind of yellowish in this picture. That's the liquid that the blood travels in the blood. The red blood cells are those ones that have kind of a depression in the middle. So like I said, they carry your oxygen around. The platelets are in there, they're yellow. And then there's these big white blood cells. So when they draw your blood and they measure all those things, it's because they're all flowing through the blood at the same time. They go out to tissues and then they come back to the heart to be pumped around again. And in the case of the immune cells, the white blood cells, they also filter through the lymph nodes. So then at the bottom here is a little diagram of the skin. You can see those sort of layers at the bottom. Those are a cartoon drawing of the different skin layers. And then they, they have some bacteria, allergens, and chemicals that are trying to get into the skin there. Um, and so this is where the immune system comes in. And you can kind of think of your lymphocytes as army, an army of soldiers. So that bacteria is trying to get into the skin there and our lymphocyte is there patrolling in the skin because we have some that spend their time hanging out in the skin waiting for an invader. Once it recognizes an invader that it knows, it starts to attack it to stop it from infecting, but it also sends a message back to our lymph node. So that's this kind of kidney shaped thing over here is a lymph node. And you can see there's kind of tubes going into it, tubes coming out of it. And so it goes back to the lymph node and the lymph node, it can kind of function as a factory. So this guy comes back and says, we have a bacteria trying to get in. This is the bacteria. We need soldiers who know how to fight that bacteria. And then the lymph node ramps up production like a factory and makes a whole bunch of lymphocytes that can fight that kind of bacteria and sends them back out to the skin. So that way that one soldier who, who spotted the bacteria isn't on his own, he gets reinforcements and they all look really similar to him. They have sort of the, the same features because he recognized that bacteria and knows how to fight it. That's also why you might have noticed before that sometimes your lymph nodes get swollen or enlarged when you have an infection. So like for example, if someone has strep throat, the lymph nodes in their throat may be enlarged and that's the body trying to fight the infection. It sends those lymphocytes back, the, the lymph node turns up production and it has to get a little bit bigger to make room for all those soldiers that it's making and pumping out. So this is what lymphocytes actually look like. The top picture there is just a microscope image of a slide. 
And you can see those red blood cells that sort of look like a donut shape with that depression in the middle. And then right in the middle is a, one of our lymphocytes. So it's just a big cell with a big nucleus, which is kind of like the brain of a cell. Then the picture below it shows a really high power magnification where you can actually see details. So the lymphocytes are round and then they have all these projections on their surface. And those are called their surface markers. And so some of those are sort of function as an address. So it tells the lymphocyte where it's supposed to be go and what it's supposed to do. So for example, the ones in our skin have these different address markers on them that tell them they're supposed to go to the skin. And when, they, when they're flowing through the blood, they find their address and they go out into the skin and then they hang out there and that's where they do their patrolling and most of their work. That's actually the reason why cutaneous lymphoma is cutaneous because it is a problem with the lymphocytes that normally live in the skin. So that's why most of the issue with cutaneous lymphoma is in the skin and it's not in the blood is because it's those lymphocytes that are having an issue, the ones who live in the skin. Other cell surface markers are, can be the T cell receptor or the B cell receptor. So the B cell receptor looks a lot like an antibody. And then when, when it connects with something, like I said, an infection that matches that antibody, it ramps up production and sends more antibodies. The T cell receptor is very similar and it recognizes invaders. So our body makes a whole bunch of lymphocytes with sort of almost random T cell receptors on the top. So that way when a bacteria comes in, we don't sort of have to learn it and know it as a new thing. We already have some soldiers who are just kind of waiting there, hoping that the bacteria of their choice is going to come and they'll get a chance to shine and do their job. So our body makes a whole bunch of different T cell receptors and almost every T cell has a different one. And we'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about diagnosis, because sometimes if we see a difference in those T cell receptors on the surface of the lymphocytes, it helps us know if it's a lymphoma or not. And then as I mentioned, that process of the lymphocytes going from the skin to the lymph nodes and then back to the skin is called um, lymphocyte trafficking. So just kind of where they go and what they do. When it comes to cutaneous lymphoma, there's a few different di classifications um, to figure out exactly what kind of lymphoma you have. So in general, when we talk about all lymphomas, because there's more than cutaneous lymphoma. There's lymphoma in your lymph nodes and in your blood. Um, there are two basic types of lymphoma, Hodgkin, which is about 10% of lymphomas and non-Hodgkin, which is 90%. Cutaneous lymphomas are non-Hodgkin lymphomas. So we can take that non-Hodgkin group and split it into more groups and the cutaneous lymphomas are in one of those groups. It's about 13% of the total number of non-Hodgkin lymphomas. So that's one of the challenges we face with cutaneous lymphoma is it is a rarer disease. It's not as common as other diseases, which makes it a little bit harder to study it, a little bit harder to understand what we should do because the more people have a disease, the more chance you have to see how they respond to treatment or what the disease is going to do. But when it's a rarer disease, it makes it more challenging because what happens for one person may not really help you know what's going to happen for the next person. And it takes a lot more time to complete research because there's just not as many people who have the disease each year for you to study how it's behaving and how it responds to treatment. It's still not a small number. It's about 10.2 million people. Um, and of the cutaneous lymphomas, there's T cell and B cell that we sort of talked about earlier. Those cells, whichever lymphocyte goes wrong is either a T cell lymphoma or a B cell lymphoma. 80% are T cell lymphomas and about 15 to 20% are B cells. So the T cell cutaneous lymphoma is much more common than the B cell. The World Health Organization is a group that is, spans the globe and it's a bunch of doctors and researchers and they work together to sort of classify diseases because you don't want a bunch of different classifications. It makes it harder for people to talk to each other about the disease and kind of understand things and work together. So it's better to have a global classification system so we're all on the same page. They first came up with the one for cutaneous lymphomas in 2005 and then they more recently have updated it in 2016 and 2018. Because as I mentioned, we're still learning more things, sort of reclassifying things. So there's even some of the things that we thought were a lymphoma, and now we think it's not actually a lymphoma, but it's sort of similar to a lymphoma, but less aggressive. So these may continue to change as we move forward. We mostly talk about the cutaneous T-cell lymphoma classification. Um, 
and we'll get back to that in just a minute. But here's a little overview of those cutaneous T-cell lymphomas, which is the more common of the two. It usually shows up like a rash. It looks red, flaky, patches, which are flat areas of redness, and then plaques where it's a little bit more raised. Itch is really common for people with cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. It's about 80% of patients itch is one of their symptoms. And it's challenging because it can mimic or even come after other rashes like eczema, psoriasis, contact dermatitis, and that can lead to delays in diagnosis. And we aren't 100% sure how often each of those happens. You know, does someone have eczema and it turns into cutaneous T-cell lymphoma or was it lymphoma the whole time, but it just hadn't fully developed so it looked like eczema for a while? But it leads to delays in diagnosis. And it also means that often we have to do multiple biopsies, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, to, to catch the diagnosis and actually make it. There are about 3,000 new cases in the US each year. So even though it's rare, it's not a tiny number. But remember, there are 30 million or 300 million people in the US. So compared to the total number of people, 3,000 new cases a year is small. It's more common over the age of 50 and more common in men also more common in darker skin types compared to lighter skin types. The good news with cutaneous T-cell lymphoma is 90% of people have what we call an indolent or chronic course, where it's not really aggressive, it just kind of festers and, and keeps hanging out, but it doesn't get worse and it doesn't cause problems. So most people do well. That kind of goes back to that initial question of, do I have cancer? And when I'm, when I'm telling patients that they have cutaneous lymphoma, I usually tell them that, Technically, it's a lymphoma, which is a cancer, but it's, that doesn't act like a cancer. It acts more like a rash. So if you want to think of it as your rash, that's probably a better way to think about it because for the majority of people, that's what it does. It acts like a chronic rash, almost like psoriasis or eczema, kind of a rash that you just have to kind of deal with to keep it under control. We can usually treat it. At present, we don't have a cure. So the, the goal with treat, treatment is to get it to go away, but then it often comes back after a while and you have to retreat it. So it's kind of an on and off treatment coming and going. And for most people, it's not life-threatening. Like I said, that 90% do really well. Some people, it does advance and it can get formed tumors, which are thicker growths in the skin beyond just a little bit being raised. It's sort of a lump in the skin. Those can ulcerate where the top of the skin kind of opens up and it forms a sore. It can spread to the lymph nodes, the blood, the internal organs. So that's one of the stressful things about being diagnosed with cutaneous T-cell lymphoma is we don't have a great way of knowing who is going to progress and who isn't. So there's a 90% chance it's gonna act like a rash and you're gonna do well, but we don't know who that other 10% are when they first come in and get diagnosed, which makes it a little bit of a challenge and it's a little stressful for patients because you kinda always have to worry that you might be in that 10%, that but it is reassuring that 90% do well. So this is the classification for T-cell lymphomas. In just a minute, we'll talk a little bit about the B-cell lymphomas. We don't really use that classification system as much um, as the T-cell lymphomas because these are more common and we've done a lot more work kind of picking out the different subtypes. So by far the most common is cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, also known as mycosis fungoides. It's a really confusing double term because they aren't exactly synonyms. Uh, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma is all the lymphomas in the skin with T-cells, whereas mycosis fungoides is part of those. So 65% are either mycosis fungoides or there's under that MF variants is for mycosis fungoides variants. So folliculotropic means it's around the hair follicles. Granulomatous slack skin is a different kind that it just looks a little bit different. And then Cesare syndrome. So 65% are either mycosis fungoides or Cesare syndrome. And Cesare syndrome is a type of T-cell lymphoma where it does go into the blood and the skin. So we'll talk about it a little bit too. And then 25% are these primary cutaneous CD30 positive lymphoproliferative disorders. So those are those ones that I mentioned, we used to kind of call them lymphomas, but now we call it a lymphoproliferative disorder, which is sort of one step lower. It means the lymphocytes are proliferating or growing, but it's not really a lymphoma. And those ones were the ones that recently were kind of reclassified. Um, and then there are some other rarer types of cutaneous T-cell lymphomas. Um, 
And unfortunately, when you have a rare disease, then when you have even rarer subtypes, some of these, the, the number of patients is really low. So we're still really working to learn more about them. The reason they sort of classify these is because they have different qualities. So if they have more qualities in common with each other, they, they'll put them together. And if one of them starts to have a lot of qualities that's different, then they might separate it into a different disease and give it a different name if it seems like it's not really the same disease. So you can have the same disease that looks slightly different, but it's the same disease, or you can have two diseases that look similar, but as you learn more about the way they behave or the way they show up on the skin, you separate them into two separate diseases. When it comes to B cell lymphomas, we add the word primary before cutaneous. So primary means starts in the skin. The other kind is secondary, um, which we'll talk about in just a second. So for primary cutaneous B cell lymphomas, it's about, like I said, 20 to 25% of the cutaneous lymphomas. The other ones are the T cells. A lot of times it looks different. It doesn't look like a rash. It looks like a bump, a red or purple nodule, sort of a lump under the skin. And there are three types. One is follicular center, one is marginal zone, and then there's a diffuse large cell large B cell lymphoma, also known as leg type. So the most common are the follicular center and marginal zone. And those luckily too, tend to be indolent and really respond well to treatment in most cases. The, the leg type diffuse large cell B cell lymphoma can be a little bit more aggressive. So luckily it's not as common as the two that are, are more, uh, not as aggressive. And then Anytime you have a B cell lymphoma, it's important that you make sure it's a primary cutaneous B cell lymphoma because if you have a B cell lymphoma in your blood or lymph nodes, it can actually spread to the skin and show up as a lump. And one of the challenges with lymphomas of the blood or the lymph nodes is sometimes they're hard to diagnose because you don't see any changes. You know, people might just feel a little run down or have night sweats, have fevers, sort of immune reactions that seem strange, so they can be harder to diagnose. Well, when it spreads to the skin, it's a little bit easier because now you can see something. So anytime we diagnose a B cell lymphoma in the skin, we always do more workup to make sure that there's nothing going on in the blood or the lymph nodes. So that might mean some blood tests, might mean some imaging like a CT scan or a PET scan to make sure that it's not actually an internal problem that's just showing up in the skin. So when it comes to diagnosis, usually what we use is a skin biopsy. There are certain clues to especially cutaneous T cell lymphoma or even B cell lymphoma. Like I said, when we see that red purple lump on the skin, we might have some suspicion, but we need a biopsy because the biopsy is where we take a little sample of the skin, which we numb it up first. We numb up an area, take a sample of the skin and send it to the lab. At the lab, they look under the microscope to see what's going on. So they sort of, if you remember that cartoon of the, the skin, that's sort of how the skin looks on a biopsy. And then they look for what's going on there. Are there regular T cells? Are there abnormal T cells? And a lot of times with cutaneous T cell lymphoma, it'll take multiple biopsies before we get the diagnosis. And it's, it's part of the disease. So what's challenging is even when you have the abnormal T cells in your skin, often you have a lot of normal T cells there too. And normal T cells are also show up in all the other rashes like psoriasis and eczema and allergic rashes, poison ivy, bug bites. The T cells go there and they do their job of fighting off whatever the problem is. Or in the case of psoriasis or eczema, sometimes it's you know a bad response where they're going there and they really shouldn't be, but they're acting like they're fighting some kind of invader. And so that's one of the challenges is that there's these normal T cells that will be there. So you're looking for these abnormal ones. One way to look for them is just looking at the microscope slide. So they just look and they see if they look different. Sometimes they can say, oh, these T cells look different. These look like cancerous ones. They're a little bit bigger and they look a little different, but sometimes it's harder. So that's why I have that picture of the bananas there is you can say the one to the, the right is a, right, a yellow banana, and the one to the left is a brown banana, but what do you call the one in the middle? Do you call it a brown banana or a yellow banana? It's kind of in the middle. And that's the way it is when they're looking at the slides for, for T cell lymphomas. Sometimes it's very obvious that it's not a T cell lymphoma. All the T cells look pretty normal and small. Sometimes it's really obvious. There's a lot of abnormal T cells there, which helps out. 
And then there's those in the middle ones where it's kind of a tough call and maybe it's a T cell lymphoma and maybe it's not. It's also hard because we think that it's possible that these rashes change with time, like I mentioned earlier. Maybe you start with eczema and all those T cells are in your skin and they're kind of having a, a good time and going crazy and causing your eczema rash. And then one of them becomes abnormal and turns into T cell lymphoma. So that can make it tricky too, because your initial biopsies may show something like eczema or psoriasis that later becomes T cell lymphoma. So most people have their rash an average of four to six years before they're actually diagnosed with T cell lymphoma, which is frustrating when you don't really have the diagnosis. And the, the reason there's a picture of Cher up there is because you think, well, why can't the pathologist just recognize it when they see it? So I put up a picture of Cher. Everybody knows who Cher is until I reveal that there's a second person there who's a Cher impersonator. And I, I can't actually tell which one's Cher and which one's the impersonator. So sometimes these other things can impersonate T cell lymphoma or T cell lymphoma can impersonate a more benign rash like eczema. And it makes it really tricky. So some of the other tricks that we have are to look at those surface markers. So they make their, their microscope slides and then they can put these stains on them and the stains stick to the surface markers and that way, and then they have dye on them so that it, it sort of highlights those different things. And then the other thing is called a, a T cell receptor gene study that we can do. So here's an example of the special stains. To the left where it says H&E, that's the normal skin biopsy. They put those stains on all skin biopsies to make it kind of that pink purple color. You can see at the top is the, the outer part of the skin and there's some flakes up there. And then there's these kind of layers of the, the epidermis. And then that pinker part underneath the purple layers is the dermis, the deeper layer of the skin. And I know you guys won't be able to fully understand all of this because it takes years of training. But if you look at on the first column D, that's kind of a close up and it shows some of those abnormal T cells at the, um, in the skin. And then to the right side are a couple of those stains. And so the whole point of showing this is just to show that it's kind of hard to see what's going on without the stains. But then when you use the stain, for example, if you look at G and then you look at I, I has that stain that's telling us these surface markers are on these T cells. And so you, it confirms that those are the abnormal ones, but you can see some of them around it are still the normal ones. So that's how the stains can sometimes be helpful to figure out what's going on. Still, it can be a challenge at times, but it's one more piece of the puzzle that the, the pathologist or dermatopathologist who's looking at the slides can get these special stains to get a better clue. The T cell receptor gene rearrangement test goes back to those, those T cell receptors on the surface of the T cells. And like I said before, normally there's a big variety. So if you think of the T cells as our army troopers again, you can see from the Beetle Bailey cartoon down there, there's a whole bunch of different soldiers. They're not all the same person, there's different ones. And that's normal. Normally there's a mix of a bunch of different T cells. Maybe some of them are there waiting to fight a bacteria, some are waiting to fight a virus, some are waiting to fight a parasite or a fungus. So they're different and the receptors on their surface are different, sort of making them look different. So this test looks at those cell surface receptors and it sort of measures it for each of the T cells to see, is there a clone? Because that's what the problem is with T cell lymphoma is one of those T cells starts just growing out of control and cloning itself. And those are the abnormal ones are these clones. So it's kind of like the same one again and again and again and again. So with a normal T cell receptor study, you see that there's a whole variety and there's not one that has more numbers than the other. Or if it does, it's just a little bit more. With the T cell uh, lymphoma, you get a whole bunch of clones. So all of a sudden there's a big spike where a whole bunch of the cells have the same T cell receptor and they call that clonality. So that is one of the other helpful clues. The challenge with it is it's not perfect. So you can actually see a false positive where you don't have lymphoma, but the test is positive. If you have bug bites or drug rashes, because there's a whole bunch of clones, but it's okay that they're there because they're all reacting to the same thing. So you get a bug bite, your body sends the immune cells in there to take care of it. It sends a whole bunch of the same kind to fight off the one thing, the, the bug venom. And so it shows up as a T cell clone, but it's actually just a whole, a big group of the same T cells. 
Same idea with the drug rash. You take a medication, you get a rash from it. All those T cells causing the rash are the ones that react to the medication. So they can be a false positive. And it's also not perfect because not everybody with T cell lymphoma has a positive test. As with any medical test, sometimes you have the disease and the test doesn't show it. Luckily, people are kind of more aware of this with COVID, where the, the swab isn't always perfect. And some people who have it, it doesn't get picked up on the testing. So it's another piece to the puzzle. And a lot of times we end up using all these pieces together. We look at our biopsies, we look at the special stains, we do a T cell re gene rearrangement study, and we put it all together along with how the rash looks, how it's been behaving, and we try to make the diagnosis that way. But it's not always easy. It's like the bananas again. Sometimes it's a slam dunk and you know exactly that it's T-cell lymphoma. Sometimes you know it's not. Other times you end up a little bit in the middle. And sometimes that's where we'll do the repeat biopsies. So if the first biopsy didn't really get us to the diagnosis and wasn't super helpful, we can do another biopsy and that might give us another piece. Sometimes if we're really suspicious of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, we'll even do more than one biopsy at once. So we might biopsy some one from your hip and one from your back, just because it gives us a little bit of a better picture and more information. And because skin biopsies are a pretty safe procedure, low complications, a little bit of pain, pretty easy. So it's not a big deal to take a couple biopsies. So that kind of covers the diagnosis. And unfortunately, it talks about the, the, the challenges in diagnosis that we face. We are getting better and better. Those T-cell gene studies, they're improving them and making them more accurate and more um, useful for us. So that's one of the good things is there's a, some really, really smart researchers working on T-cell lymphomas and cutaneous lymphomas and making some great advances that should help us all. Then staging. Staging is a term we use for all cancers. So the purpose of staging is there's different stages of the disease that sort of reflect the severity. So it helps us to know the prognosis or what, what we would expect the disease to do. Is it going to get better? Is it going to get worse? Is it going to cause problems? And it helps us to pick a treatment because it lets us know where the disease is, where those abnormal T cells are and what they're doing. So for example, if they're in the blood, we might treat it differently than if they're only in the skin. It can also help us know the severity of the disease. Um, so the more severe, the higher the stage will be. One of the interesting things with staging is we, it, we do it at the time of diagnosis. So we do your staging then and that's your stage. Sometimes we will restage if things change. So generally speaking, you have the same stage and then even as you get better, we don't say you've gone down in your stage. We just say that you're responding to treatment. But if things change a lot, we may do a restaging, especially if things get worse, because that may then make us use different treatments. As I said, if it goes from being skin only to involving the blood, we will restage and rechange our treatments. Um, so it may or may not change with time. Some people, their stage just stays the same. Other people, it advances. Luckily, for the majority of people, it doesn't advance. It does stay the same. So what tests do we use in staging? The skin biopsy could be one oftentimes blood tests to see if there's anything going on in the blood, possibly a lymph node biopsy, where if you have an enlarged lymph node, we may actually use a little tool to get in there and take a sample from it to see what is going on inside the lymph node. Is it the lymphoma cells or is the lymph node just reacting like it does for an infection? And same idea with the bone marrow. We might check the bone marrow if we think that the, the, can't, the abnormal cells are coming from the bone marrow, but usually for cutaneous lymphomas, they're not. And then imaging, which could be a CT scan or a PET scan. And a PET scan is kind of an interesting way to do a CT scan where they give you um, a substance that the, will kind of go to the cancer cells and show them a little better. So the cancer cells take up more of this sugar that they give you because they're growing really fast. So they eat a lot like a teenager. And then the, the sugar is tied to a dye that shows up on the scan. So the areas that get more of the, take more of the sugar, get more of the dye and show up on the scan. So it's a good way to kind of look for areas of rapid growth in the body. Um, so sometimes we need to do that depending on what things look like at the beginning. When it comes to the staging for cutaneous T cell lymphoma, we have a very well laid out staging system. There's one for B cell lymphoma. We don't end up using it very much for especially for the cutaneous ones because they usually respond to local treatments. You sort of have a lump, 
we can treat the lump and that takes care of it. But we spend a little more time with our cutaneous T-cell lymphoma staging because it does affect the treatments and the prognosis. So they have this TNM staging system, and this is kind of used across a bunch of different cancers, and it's slightly different for each cancer based on um, you know, different sizes, different things that affect the growth rates. So the T stands for tumor, and you can get a score of one to four for your tumor. N is your nodes or your lymph nodes, and that's a score of zero to four. M is metastasis or spread beyond the lymph nodes, so to like your blood or your other organs, and that's zero to one. And then B is one that's included with CTCL staging, and that's for blood involvement. So it's a little confusing because you get numbers for each of those, and then you have these overall stages as well. So there's basically stages one through four. One is localized and you don't have a lot. Two is localized, like localized to the skin, only in the skin, not everywhere, just in a local area, but it's more advanced. So you have more of it. Three is regional where it's spread beyond the skin, but not everywhere. And then four is spread everywhere. So the ones that you'll hear the most commonly are these. Stage 1A means it's only in your skin and less than 10% of your skin has patches or plaques. So flat red flaky areas or slightly raised red flaky areas. And when I say slightly raised, it's raised about as much as like a bug bite raises up or a pimple, not very raised, not very thick, not a growth. Then stage 1B is just the same as 1A, except you have more than 10% of your skin involved. And if you ever wanna estimate how much skin is involved, the palm of your hand is 1% of your skin surface area. So you can kind of use your palms and count up how many palms would it take to cover my areas that have my rash. And that tells you what percentage of the body surface area it is. Each palm is 1%. Stage 2A is any amount of skin involved, plus you have enlarged lymph nodes, but the lymph nodes don't have cancer. They're just reacting to the rash because your normal lymphocytes actually try to fight the cancerous ones, and that's helpful. Our normal lymphocytes actually try to fight a lot of different types of cancer, which helps us out. Um, so that is you have any amount of skin involvement and your lymph nodes are big, but when we do the biopsy on the lymph nodes, there's no cancer in the lymph nodes. Stage 2B is when you get tumors on the skin. So like I said, those are a little bit bigger. It's a lump. And then you still don't have it in the lymph nodes. Stage 3 is erythroderma, which means red skin. So you, almost all of your skin turns red for stage 3, and you've just got it everywhere, but you don't have involvement in your blood. Then stage 4A we call Cesare syndrome, which I mentioned earlier. That usually you have red skin all over and the abnormal T cells are in your blood and or your lymph nodes. So that's a little bit more beyond stage three because the, the cancer is actually in the blood and then it's spilling over into the skin and causing the redness all over. And then stage 4B, you have the red skin all over, cancer in the blood, maybe the lymph nodes, and it has spread to other organs. So that's the most advanced stage. So that's the staging system. It's a little bit complicated, but it is kind of helpful to roughly know what your stage is or about what your stage is because, like I said, when it comes to treatments, we can base a lot of them on the stage. So for early stage disease, which is your 1A, 1B, we might do just topical therapies on the skin. As you get more advanced, we might move up the therapies to, to more advanced things. Or if you start with a more advanced stage, we won't just give you creams for it. We'll do creams plus something that's going to treat the internal involvement. In terms of the causes, it's a tough one. People often ask, why did I get this? Why is this showing up? What caused this? And we don't know. We know it's not an infection and it's not contagious. So that's important to know. You can't give it to other people. You can't spread it. It's not hereditary, but it might be related to the genes that control your immune system. So it's not something that you're gonna necessarily pass on to your kids, or it's very rare to see someone pass it on to their kids. It almost never happens, um, but it may still be related to your genes, especially the ones that are involved with your immune system, because that's where the problem is, and that's where something went wrong. And there's no clear environmental association or infectious association. So sometimes we think because it's these T cells, maybe they, 
reacted to an infection and then something went wrong and they turned into cancer while they were trying to fight the infection. But that hasn't ha been shown consistently. So we don't think that there's a clear association. It's not like everybody who gets cutaneous T cell lymphoma had strep throat and that's why it happened. So unfortunately, we have more questions than answers when it comes to the causes and the reason people get it. And we just really don't understand it. We do think um, that sunlight may play somewhat of a role, but it's actually the opposite of usual skin cancer. So that question I posed earlier of, is this a skin cancer? Generally, we don't refer to cutaneous lymphomas as under the umbrella of skin cancer, because skin cancers are called squamous cell carcinoma or basal cell carcinoma or melanoma. They are usually come from the cells that make up the skin layers. So that's why they are skin cancer, but lymphoma is lymphoma. And when it's cutaneous, it's cutaneous lymphoma is because it doesn't come from the skin cells. It comes from the immune cells, but involves the skin. And so we think the sun may be related to um, cutaneous T cell lymphoma because it tends to show up in areas that don't get any sun, which is the opposite of other skin cancers. The sun tends to cause cancer when it comes to melanoma, basal cell, those ones that the more sun you get, the higher your risk, and they show up in areas where you've gotten sunburns and suntans. Cutaneous T cell lymphoma tends to be under the underwear, in the butt, on the thighs, those areas that don't get sun, and sometimes sunlight can actually help treat it or different parts of the sun's rays can help to treat it. But we don't think that's a cause. We don't think blocking your skin from the sun causes it. We just think that it shows up in those areas because the other areas get sun. So it, it has a harder time showing up since the sunlight sort of treats those areas. So unfortunately, like I said, we have more questions than answers. We're still working on it. We're still trying to figure out why this happens for some people and why it doesn't for others. And that kind of fits with uh, nor all the lymphomas. We don't really know why some people get them and others don't. In terms of prognosis, if you've never heard it before, prognosis is the medical term to sort of say, we're gonna predict what's gonna happen. You know, is this gonna be a boring rash for you that just is annoying for a long time or is it gonna advance? So the prognosis is based on the stage at diagnosis. Earlier disease or lower stages are better, and that's that 90% of people who present with stage 1A, 1B, they, they don't have advanced disease and they tend to do really well. But there's a lot of variety, and the way we figure out the prognosis is we sort of look at everybody who has the disease and what happened. And so we say, all right, of all the people who were this stage at diagnosis, what did their disease do? And so it's sort of based on averages which is a really challenging and a rare disease because it means it may not give you that much information about your case. So like I said earlier, there's a 90% chance if you're early stage, it's not gonna advance and it's gonna do well, but we don't really know why sometimes it goes, it does differently and it, it gets worse. Same thing, cutaneous B cell lymphomas, for the most part on average have good prognosis. Less than 10% of them progress when it's a cutaneous B cell lymphoma that started in the skin. And usually we can just remove it with surgery or treat it with some local X-ray radiation to the area and that clears it up and cures it and there's no more problems. But it doesn't happen for everybody. Some people, it gets worse. Um, so it's a little bit of a difficult thing when it comes to prognosis. I usually tell patients, Try not to lose sleep because the odds are in your favor that it's gonna act like a rash and not like a cancer, and it's gonna be more of a nuisance. But it's also the reason that I don't give people a cream and say, see you later. We keep checking back to see how is it doing? Is it responding to treatment? Is it clearing up? Is it getting better? Is it not responding? And maybe we need to try something else. So once you have a cutaneous T cell lymphoma, when you see the doctor who you see for it, you're going to be friends for a while and you're going to keep doing surveillance even if you do really well. Then to finish things out, I just wanted to mention, and I've kind of said it a few times throughout the, the presentation, that cutaneous lymphoma is really a personal disease. Each patient's story is really different. How long they had it before diagnosis, how it first showed up, when it first showed up, if they have itch, if they don't have itch, if they have other symptoms, everyone is really different with it. No one size fits all for treatment either. There's not one treatment we can give. Like for example, if you have strep throat, we know exactly what antibiotic to give. And for most people, the vast majority, it works really well. It's not so with cutaneous T cell lymphoma, which means you have to be ready to kind of try different things, maybe try some treatments, see if they work, 
see if they don't work. You might have to do other things. And it requires a little bit of patience finding the right regimen or combination of treatments that's going to work really well for you because it's different for everybody. And we kind of have experience treating people and we say, you know, generally this treatment works pretty well for people with your stage. But like I said, that's why we keep checking back and making sure that it works well. We don't just trust that it's going to. And then, like I mentioned, we're all still learning. Patients are still learning about the disease. Patients are still teaching physicians and researchers about the disease. We're still getting new tests and new learning new things about the, the details of these lymphocytes and why they behave the way they do and why they respond to treatment and different ways we can treat them. So it's, it's very reassuring that there's a lot of really smart people working on making things better and new drugs are coming out that work even better than the ones we've had in the past with fewer side effects. Um, but I would just say that's one of the challenges for patients is that it's not an easy disease. It's not easy to diagnose. It's not easy to predict what it's going to do. It's not easy to find the right treatment. So it's a journey that you're going to go on with your physician and just be prepared. But if you find the right physician, you'll, you'll continue to, on that journey together until you find the best treatment that's going to work out for you. And I just want to thank the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation again because they are such a valuable research, resource for patients. They have tons of useful information. I kind of, I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir because you're already at this presentation, but the website has so much useful information, so many great videos that cover a lot of the things I've talked about, cover things in more detail. And it's just really great that they're out there for patients to help because you get this disease and it's a challenge. Um, and with that, I just want to thank you very much for your attention and I'll pass it back to Hillary. Thank you. Thank you just so much, Dr. Dave Bluey. You know, we're, we're really grateful for your time and your expertise, and we just really appreciate you explaining things so well. You know, we recognize that living with a rare disease, it can be intimidating, and it's, it's wonderful to be able to break things down a bit and to understand more about it. And um, like you said, it's encouraging to hear that the T-cell gene studies are continuing to improve and just to hear that there's so much research being done and that there are advances being made all the time. So, Thank you all for joining us for this session. We really hope that you found it informative. Uh, just before we go, I would like to thank our corporate partners and individual donors again for your continued support um, in making these programs possible for us. Uh, please make sure to check out the other available sessions on our two-day curriculum. And if you would like to go back and reference this particular session, it will be available on demand on our website following the event. So thank you so much. Thanks everyone.